This is not a fish tale. The epigraph to this poem is by J. Charles Delbeck and John E. Randall. Fish can and do live much longer lives in captivity than in the wild. No one gives the seahorse or clownfish a choice whether to leave the ocean they were born in, be separated from families and homes, to live in an aquarium. No one can understand their language if they say they don't much like the great glass boxes they find themselves in, swimming to entertain and educate another species of being. Here no humans drop hooks into the water to snare them. None will skin, bone, and fry them on a grill. Instead, each day, someone will drop food into the water or train them to catch it in their mouths. Still, no one asks if they are happy to trade their freedom for safety from predators and a guarantee of daily food. Do they think a longer, more boring life is better? No one asks the grouper, the jellyfish, the grama. Heritage Tree For over 200 years, an oak in the side yard has inhaled carbon and expelled oxygen. Its large forked limbs invite birds and cradle my dreams of sitting closer to cotton-puffed sky while it shades me with generous branches tipped with sculpted leaves and food for acorn-loving squirrels and burrowing chipmunks. The tree stood here with Potawatomi tribes and later summer campers before brick and wooden houses filled the neighborhood where fallen leaves are raked and bagged each autumn followed by catkins each spring. Gray, deeply furrowed bark wraps the silent giant standing guard over all in spite of storms and parched days into nights seasonal cycles that have come before and will continue its journey long after I am gone. Prospero's Threat The epigraph from Shakespeare's The Tempest if thou more murmurest, I will rend an oak and peg thee in his naughty entrails till thou hast howled away twelve winters. Who has not wished to live into a tree, be quaffed by a nest of fledglings squawking featherless expectations of wormy nourishment, to be shielded round by the solid, rough surface thrust of bark, its deep paths that part around a branch, and rejoin on the other side in skyward climb, to be at once rooted and sun-lured within the rhythmic exchange of light and loamy depths, of consumed and new-made air, of bud's eruption and the falling away of foliage. I myself would half embrace the pithy thread of Prospero, to be conjured back into the core of oak, Aerialed there to pass a dozen snowy solstices, aging into the very grain of hardwood. My person infused with uprising sap, drawn from dark undersoil, to wend through me a meandering path toward beckoning sunlight. Day by reach, moon by twig, and season by centimeter, imperceptibly, I would gesture out a limb above some humble shelter where ruffians wayfaring in my naughty heights could camp in craggy branches and plunge into manhood from the vantage of a saddle. A Bowl of Cherry Poems 1. Cherries, red and shiny as the beads on mother's necklace, the ones she passed on to me when she saw how well it went with my new dress. 2. Knowing Moby Dick was about to send him to Davy's locker, Stubbs sighed for that last meal 
promised to inmates on death row, but his wish was not steak or lobster, but cherries from Nantucket. Three. What a disappointment to learn that the story of George Washington confessing that he chopped down the cherry tree with his hatchet, a story told to encourage children to be honest, was a falsehood invented by an itinerant minister. Four. No one could make a better cherry pie than Dad, just the right balance of sweet and tart in a tender crust, warmed and perfected by a single scoop of vanilla ice cream. Who would guess he learned to bake in Italy with the 85th Infantry, which slogged its way north all the way to the Po Valley? 5. Before you even think of lamenting the presence of Asian immigrants in this country, stop to thank Ah Bing for his role in developing our favorite cherry. A dozen years after I rounded with the seed of her, we choose cherry pie over chocolate cake, perhaps because she wants change, or because it's August and charming boxes of cherries sang us their sour song at the farmer's market. In the white porcelain bowl they are round and smooth, like she, too lovely to mar with pity. They are plump as the breasts that assert themselves to the forefront like new ideas, red as the nurture sleeping in her womb waiting for life, or the moon-dark flow that will accompany her into the fullness of possibility. Tart as the sorrow that will follow her youth as surely as tides the moon, and inviting as life is on the early side of its discoveries, its duties, its unexpected sadness, and surprises of small beauties like this adolescent girl and the waiting bowl brimming with unpitted ripe pie cherries. I'm going to read to you a poem by the French poet Charles Baudelaire entitled La Invitation au Voyage, or in English, Invitation to the Voyage. The poem was published in 1857 in Baudelaire's famous La Fleur du Mal, or Flowers of Evil, and is translated from the French by Keith Waldrop. After this poem, I will read you my response to Baudelaire's poem. Invitation to the Voyage Child, Sister, Think how sweet to go out there and live together, to love at leisure, love and die in that land that resembles you. For me, damp suns and disturbed skies share mysterious charms with your treacherous eyes as they shine through tears. There, there's only order and beauty, abundant, calm, voluptuous, Gleaming furniture polished by years passing would ornament our bedroom. Rarest flowers, their odors vaguely mixed with amber. Rich ceilings, deep mirrors, and oriental splendor. Everything there would address our souls privately in their sweet native tongue. There, there's only order, beauty, abundant, calm, voluptuous. See on these canals those sleeping boats whose mood is vagabond. It's to satisfy your least desire that they come from the world's end. Setting suns reclothe fields, the canals, the whole town in hyacinth and gold, the world falling out sleep in a warm light. There, there's only order, beauty, abundant, calm, voluptuous. Letter to Baudelaire Response to Baudelaire's L'Invitation au Voyage Lover, 
I am drunk on your warm eyes. One dangerous look from you, and I wait alone, imprisoned, spinning round and round, searching for your love in globes of color, seeking escape from black and white boredom. I wish I could fly on your wings, the wings of a poet, escape flames like a moth rises, breathe the perfume from summer gardens, if only we could go to the land you speak of. I could drink your wine forever, kiss your sweet lips of desire, but behold, all beauty will die, only the abyss of our ecstasy will remain, where steep cliffs knock our hearts to the gorge of eternal impermanence, if there can be such a thing. We continue to be broken each moment, to be born, to live, to die, every adversity a souvenir, returning us to laughter, delusion, or pain. Let us turn away from escape and seek instead wisdom that comes with age. Let us stay where we are, love, where the weight of suffering increases our burdens, but leaves us with so much, much more to give.